Genesis 25, verses 27 through 34 will be our text this morning. In it, it's, it's, you know, it's Jacob and Esau. Esau sells his birthright for a bowl of beans, which if you saw in your, the, the, the title there in your, in your bulletin was, Don't Trade It Away for Beans, which is what, sadly, Esau did. So opening question for you before we read our passage. What in your life, be it a possession, an achievement, whether you've won it, earned it, bought it, it was given to you, you know, your most prized whatever, would you trade away for a bowl of beans? Would anyone make that trade? If I said, hey guys, here's a bowl of beans for your most valued possession, how many of you would take me up on that offer? I don't see any, any head shaking. Yeah, I'd do that. I'd give up my most valued possession for a bowl of beans or depending on your verses, like your, your, your Bible, when we get to it, could say beans or lentils or stew or porridge, something, you know, to, to give you the visual, a bowl of mush, Porridge, something, is what Esau says. That's more important than what I, what I have waiting for me. So Genesis 25, we'll start at verse 27. We'll read through verse 34. It's Esau sells his birthright. As the boys grew up, that being Jacob and Esau, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me right now? But Jacob said, First, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. So he traded away his firstborn rights, his ability to... Pass on the family name, his double portion, taking over the family business for bowl soup. In the previous section, Genesis 25, 19 through 26, we'll read that Isaac married Rebekah when he was 40. And it wasn't until he was 60 that twin sons were born. Boom, easy math, right? 20 years. 20 years passed. Of course, in the passage, we aren't told how long Isaac pleaded with the Lord on his wife's behalf. But eventually, the Lord answered his request for them to have children. Of course, a side note here, too, is you, know, you might be praying for something. We all have a prayer list, right, that we keep. We have needs, we have wants, we have concerns that we want the Lord to take care of. For here, you know, Isaac prayed 20 years for children. If we're praying for something... Don't give up. It may take a while, but just an example to not give up. Keep praying and pleading before the Lord and don't give up until you get your answer. Of course, Matthew 7, 7 and 8 backs that up. And no, we sung that song earlier, or at least the song that alluded to it. You know, the ask, seek, and knock passage. If you knock, the door will be open. If you ask, you'll receive. If you'll seek, you'll find. And it's not just a one-time knock, a one-time ask, a one-time seek. It's a continual process until 
you get your answer. So back to our story. We have two boys. Esau, he's the oldest, he's red, he's hairy, he's born first. Jacob, more fair-complected, because we know when you read the passage of them being born, one grabs the heel of the other when they're coming out. It's the only time I know something like, like this happening, right? I've never heard any stories of anybody having twins these days to where one is, no, I want to be first. But here, that's what happened. So Esau's older, he's hairy, he's loved by his father. Jacob's more, more fair, loves to be at home. He's the favorite of his mother. Already right there, you can tell, that's going to cause issues, right? Mom loves me. Well, Dad loves me. That's already, you know angst in the house. Of course, if you're familiar with this, this story, this saga, if you will, we know how it turns out later, right? There's conniving, there's lying, there's cheating, there's... It's not good later on. Because you have the oldest son Esau, the favorite of the father, the one that the family line was to go through, the one that the double blessing was to be given to... He had everything right lined up for him. I'm the oldest. I've got everything's going to be handed to me. I'm set. But that bowl of beans looks pretty good. You have the youngest son, Jacob, the favorite of his mother. The one who would have received, if you want to call it, the leftovers of everything else. Well, my brothers are going to get double, and I'm left with whatever. He's going to be the one that the family goes through. Abraham, Isaac. Esau, right? And that's normally how things would have went. Jacob wouldn't have been in charge of the family name or land or business, but he seizes an opportunity that's presented him, does he not? Right or wrong, right? He seizes this opportunity. Esau, who we read, was a skillful hunter. He comes in from, from being out in the wilderness, and he says he was... Starving. Oh, I'm famished. I'm starving. Oh. Anybody ever ever been starving? I've not eaten in the past two hours, right? I'm, whoo. It's possible that yeah, Esau may have been putting on, uh, putting on a little bit. And he, was, you know, he even says, my birthright's not doing me any good. Right now, I'd rather have that right now. Of course, it is doubtful that Esau was truly starving. He was a skillful hunter. So it's like, what skillful hunter? I know some of you guys have hunted. You take supplies with you, right? Nothing else. You've got your bag of beef jerky. You've got something. Maybe your little Debbie's, you've got something to take with you to snack on. Of course, no. Little Debbie's not around then, but, you know, you think, what skillful hunter wouldn't have took something with him? Maybe he was just, he didn't want to cook what he, he had brought in. Maybe he wanted to save it for his father. Or maybe, true, he just didn't catch anything or, or enough. Whatever the reason, he just said, I am starving. And he despised his birthright enough to not even wait for normal meal time. No, wait for, then we'll just, no, you get breakfast, you got lunch, you got dinner, right? He wants it right now. It's thought that Esau might, might not have been serious about the trade. Or, eh, I can say whatever I want. We don't read that there's any other witnesses here. It's just Jacob and Esau. And maybe he thought he could claim his brother was lying, right? If you've had kids, maybe remember when you were a kid, right? Mom, he's not telling the truth. Even if they may have been, right? I'm the oldest. Mom's got to believe me, right? Dad's got to believe me. You know, But for something as serious as the birthright, the double portion, carrying on the family name, this shouldn't have even been something to, to joke about. Hey, brother, give me your inheritance and I'll give you this soup. No, I'm not even joke about that. Of course, now listen, I like beans as much as the next guy. We made soup Friday night. And then we ate soup into Saturday. Happens when you make soup, right? You've got leftovers. But I wouldn't trade anything grand or major for a bowl of beans. 
It just that's just silly. But sadly, some people trade away more important things, things they worked long and hard for in exchange for something not as good. Or they try to take shortcuts and they don't work out. They're trading something fabulous, something great, something better for something far less. Sadly, we know of husbands or wives that have traded away long marriages for a bowl of beans. Athletes who cheat via using steroids or other drugs, right? And they get caught and was it worth it? Now you're banned from the league forever, right? Your records are tainted. A promising student that plagiarizes or cheats on a test and now they're kicked out of school. It's like, good luck, right? That bowl of beans wasn't worth it, was it? Instead of working hard and saving, someone decides to steal or scam and gets caught and now they're in prison and all for what they thought was worth it. Here's a shortcut. I can cheat. I can lie. I can steal. Nope. Not worth it. Of course, Scripture is full of examples too of people that couldn't wait or thought their way was better or wanted to sin even though they knew it was wrong. You can think of a few examples I have written down. Abraham and Sarah couldn't wait, could they? They knew the promise, but God's just taken too long. So we'll do it ourselves. And then you bring in Hagar, and then there's Ishmael, and we know all the issues that that caused. David is, you know, out, out on his balcony, right? He should have been in war. He should have been with the troops. Ooh, look, pretty lady. We know what happens with, with that. Uriah, Bathsheba's wife, ends up getting murdered because he's betrayed. Go to the front lines. All right, troops, pull back. He's dead. The baby that they conceived died. You jump into the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira wanted applause, right? People were bringing in their goods, selling things, giving to the church. Sure, this is everything we got from selling our property. Here you go. Dead. All because they wanted to trade something valuable for something a lot less meaningful. And we can even make it personal. What about your faith? What about my faith? Again, I don't ask any questions. I've not already read to myself several times. What about our faith? Do we choose the right and honorable things to do, to focus on, to think about? Or are we just scarfing down beans? Do we spend time in prayer and study? Or are we getting over there chowing down on the beans? Do we invite people to come with us? Do we come ourselves? Or again, are we over there focusing on the bowl of porridge? Are we using our talents, our resources, our gifts to build God's kingdom? Do we follow the Spirit's prompting to either do good or to avoid the bad? Or are we focused on the bowl beans? Esau traded his hunger, which was temporary, for his birthright, which was permanent. We know it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? What if it was Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? Wouldn't, wouldn't history be different? They better say, wow, if I traded away something permanent, something eternal for a fleeting feel-good. Of course, that choice set off a bunch of other events. We know later on his... His mother and his brother connive to steal the blessing that their father was going to give them. Here, dress up in, in this wool and go in there and feed your father. Oh, you, you feel like one son, but you sound like the other. We know the story. You know? Esau's mad enough to kill his brother. You know? Then the brother has to flee. All because in one moment Esau chose something over, he chose something temporary over the, the permanent. Something earthly over something that had long lasting influence. Another question What are you willing to trade for a single bowl of beans? Is it your character? I give up my character, yeah. No, we want to keep that. Your reputation. 
your word, your dedication, your family, your job, your finances, your purity, your honor. Of course, the biggest thing we have, right, is our salvation. I'm going to give up Jesus for a bowl of beans. All right, that's what Satan is tempting you to do, right? Sin once, okay, and then sin twice, and then eight times, and then a hundred times, and then never go back to Jesus. Ha, ha, I won. You traded away everything, the most important thing, for whatever it is. Of course, each of us are faced with temptations, perhaps daily, and we must choose whether we'll stay true to God, His ways, His will, His standards, or we choose the beans. Right, every time we're faced with a temptation, right, we have to choose right then there. Am I going to obey God and follow God, or am I going to say, God, I know what you say, but I don't care. Right? When we sin, that's what we're doing, right? We know the thou shalt nots. We know the commandments that God tells us, do this and don't do that. But at the moment we're tempted, right, we have to make the choice. Either I know and I'm going to follow you and I'm going to say no to temptation or eh, whatever, I'm going to do it anyway. That's pretty much the needy gritty of it, right? Of course, Jesus himself was tempted directly by the devil, but he refused to trade to trade in. Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 both give the account of Jesus being led out into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's tempted by the devil. Whether he was tempted throughout the 40 days or at the end of the 40 days, you know, that's up for a debate. But the devil does offer Jesus three things. The kingdoms of the world, protection, and to turn stones into bread. You know, use your power for selfish reasons. Tempt God into saving you by jumping off. Don't worry about going through the cross to get the, to get the world. I'll give it to you right now. Just bow down and worship me. Jesus was tempted by things that were coming down the road anyway, but why wait? Why be persecuted and humiliated? Do it now. Of course, the turning the stones to bread. You know, it's like, I've never fasted for 40 days. And I'd say after that time, one would be mighty hungry. Sometimes we joke, even we say, man, it's been four hours since I had breakfast. I'm hungry now. Much less waiting how much, how much longer. I mean, if you, if you fasted any bit of time, be it a day, three days, five days, a week, well, you know that the hunger temptation creeps in. I know, Lord, I've, I've said I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for X amount of time, but my tummy is rumbly, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and eat. He was tempted to, to do that. But we know Jesus turned down Satan's offers. He said no to temptation, and he refuted the devil using Scripture. Of course, the best way for us to defeat the devil too, right, is to know God's word, refute him with that too. I know you want me to sin in this way, but I'm not going to do it. Scripture tells me not to. I know you don't want me to serve, but Scripture tells me that I, I need to. There's Luke 14 and Matthew 5 tell us what happens to salt after it loses its saltiness or its savor, its flavor, or taste, depending on translation. It's thrown out, it's trampled on, it is good for nothing. Of course, how does salt lose its saltiness? It's by rejecting what God wants and choosing the lesser things over and over and over again. By choosing sin over sanctification. I like when things sit back to Sunday school, when it's repeated. When we choose sin over being set apart for God, that's when we lose our, our saltiness. By trading holiness for whatever else is offered to you by the world. I'm supposed to be like God. I'm supposed to be Christ-like. Not following in the footsteps of, of the world. Of course, we have two sons in this story, Jacob and Esau. Jesus also told a story about two sons parable of the, the prodigal son, right? Usually we just say prodigal son, but both sons had their own, their own issues. One son traded his good life and wound up feeding pigs. 
I ain't happy enough here. I want, I want everything now. I can't wait for dad to get old and pass on. I want my money now. That would make a weird J.G. Wentworth commercial. Yeah, it's my money and I need it now. We all know those commercials. J.G. Wentworth, right? We, all, we know the jingle. I don't think they've made a new commercial in 20 years, but we, we know it. That was the younger son. Dad, hurry up and die. I want my inheritance now. Of course, you know, the older son didn't, didn't speak up for dad. No, brother, that's awful. I mean, I'll get my money too. You know, but one son wanted his money now and ended up feeding pigs. The other brother didn't see what he had either. His good life at home, the father's right there for him to talk to and, and serve and love every day. He just complains when his brother comes home. He gets a, you're going to throw a party for him and me and my buddies can't even have a little get together. Both wanted something else than what they had and both suffered for it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17 speaks of Esau. You may remember this from our recent study that we've done in Hebrews. It says this, Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. It was too late. Oh, no. I have messed up. What have I done? He, he cries. He weeps. He's lamenting. He's. It's too late. He realizes what, what I did all those years ago. I traded away all the good things that I could have in life for one dinner. When Esau traded his birthright, nothing changed right away, did it? We don't read right in the very next passage. Okay, your birthright's done. Now I'm the boss. No, but we don't read that. It's you no know, time. Time passed. But so much was based on that one decision. The course was set. And the same holds true for us, right? We might make a bad choice, but it could be days, weeks, months, maybe even years down the road before that bad decision may catch up with us. We may think, whoo! I got away with it. Maybe I'll get away with it again. Hey, I got away with it. Maybe I'll do it again. But eventually the truth does, does come out. So even if, even if I'm fooling you or you're fooling me or one of us is fooling somebody else, so who sees everything that goes on? Our Heavenly Father does. We can't hide anything from, from Him. You know, one bad decision might not seem like much, but they can add up. And before you know it, the, the snowball, the boulder is chasing you down the mountain, right? We've seen those cartoons. Oh, we're running. Indiana Jones is in the temple, right? Being chased by the big boulder. Of course, in this situation, because we know, we, we know he got out, we may not. We can't stop it once it's set in motion, right? Oh, no, all my bad decisions that I've not repented for, that I've not made up for, that I've not confessed, they're coming after me. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Spirit, as other versions say. By the way you live, remember, He has put His seal on you, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption, right? When we get saved, where does the Spirit come and live? He lives here. He's inside each believer. But every time the Spirit says, I would like you to do this, and we go, now I'm good. We grieve the Spirit. The Spirit says, I don't want you to do that. Quit. Stop. I might do it anyway. We grieve the Spirit. Each time we ignore the Spirit's leading, be it not to sin or refuse to, good, to do good, yes, we do. We grieve the Spirit. 
course, I do believe a lifetime of grieving the Spirit could equate to blaspheming the Spirit, which Jesus says that's the only unforgivable sin, is it not? You can talk all, all you want about, about another person. You just said, about myself. But you blaspheme the Spirit. You can't be forgiven for that. Others may disagree. And now that's a good, a good debate, a good discussion, a good study to get into. But none of us think, why risk it, right? Why, why keep telling the Spirit, no, I don't care. No, I don't care. No, I don't want it. When He knows the best thing for each and every one of us. In the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit was grieved, sinned against, made sorrowful, offended, what did the Spirit do? Left somebody. Usually in the Old Testament, the Spirit worked on what one person at a time, maybe a small group at a time. Of course, in the day of Pentecost, and every believer was, was filled. Think back to King Saul. He was anointed. He was the first king. He made some egregious mistakes right in the Spirit abandoned him. He was never the same again, was he? If we trade away our most important thing, which is our salvation, for a bowl of beans, we'll be like Esau, right? Crying after the fact. Oh, why did I give it up? There we are, a day of judgment, right? We have nothing to... What defense would we have if we say, yeah, Lord, I... I I know I said I, I loved you at one point, and I even got baptized, and I lived for you for a little bit, but I traded all that away. We have, there is no, nothing we can do if we say, yeah, I walked away from the faith, I gave it up, I abandoned it. We're just like Esau. We'll be in utter darkness with the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth. Esau cried because he, it was too late to change. And once we hit eternity, it's too late to change then too, right? It's either, again, no, well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me. I never knew you. Ouch, right? Everyone in this room, anyone watching this video, will hear one of those two things, right? One just like, oh, that's the most best thing. That's the only thing I ever want to hear. Is well done. And the other would be the worst thing you could ever hear from Jesus himself. Get out. I don't know you. Shudder. We should shudder, right? To even think that could be us he's talking about. But one bad decision may not lead us to hell. But it can still impact our walk with God, our relationship with other people, and our witness. In this word here, we're tempted, we may stumble, we may falter at some point. But we're to get up, repent, confess it, ask God to pick us up, dust us off, and help us to go throughout life without making that same bad choice again. With each day, of course, perhaps many times each day, we have to choose what's most important, do we not? I was like, well, I made it through the 8 o'clock hour. Good. Let's get through the 9 o'clock hour. Let's get through the 10 o'clock hour. Can I make it to lunch? All right. Can I make it to dinner? All right. Can I make it to bedtime? All right. And if it helps you to break down the day like that to, to get by, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But each day we have to choose what's most important. And if God is not the most important, if our faith in Christ is not the most important, is that not where we get our identity from. If I'm not a Christian above all, right, that I am choosing something else. I'm choosing the bowl of beans over my Lord and Savior. Because we know what that got Esau. We know where it could lead us. So we have to be, be mindful. Am I, am I focused on God? Am I obeying God? Am I serving Him? Am I spending the time in prayer with Him? Am I reading scriptures to know what what, what the truth is, and my communion with my brothers and sisters of, of the faith, are my focused on something far less valuable. Of course, again, it's not pointing fingers like I like to do with Jeff back there. It's, you know, every time the sermon is together, it's, have I focused on beans? And maybe I have. 
Have you focused on beans? Maybe. Maybe you have, but in your head, like, that's the great thing about our, our God, right? We can always start, start anew. Today can be a brand new day. We can say, Lord, from here on out, yeah, I am going to do better at following the, the Spirit's prompting. I am going to do better about praying and, and reading and, and studying and, and fellowship. I'm, I'm going to do it. So if that's us, then we know what we have to do. And if we're like, ah, I can reject, I've been rejecting the beans for a long time. Great. So we don't need to be, you know, prideful in our, I've done it. Great that you've trusted on the Spirit to, to do that. So in closing, trust in the Lord. Focus on what the most important things are.